Yeah, so I welcome you all to our, our knowledge and experience sharing round. Um, and I'd like us to just kick off really briefly to hear from each of you uh, just a little bit about who you are so that we actually know like, uh, yeah, what perspective is everyone here actually sharing from? So I have a few little questions that I also shared with you beforehand um, that I'll also just uh, put in the chat again. Um, and I guess one thing that I just really want to want to emphasize as we go into this um, is that th this configuration of this group here, uh, I think everyone is living in Europe, if I if I remember that correctly. Um, we're not all from Europe originally, but I think it's just important to make explicit that that's the perspective that we have here. and super uh, valuable and rich perspective, but it's not uh, representing, uh, yeah, the whole globe. Um, at the same time, I, I want to invite everyone to really speak from their own personal experience. Um, so speaking from the I, um, the, the invitation really in a fishbowl in general is to actually sort of uh, just follow the dynamic of the conversation and uh, see where it takes you. Uh, so basically, I'm going to share a prompt at the beginning. So after this introduction round, I'll, sh I'll share a prompt and we'll sort of start the conversation from there and then just, yeah, keep keep going. And I'm, I or Anna might pop in to like maybe give an additional question or a nudge in a certain direction. But uh, overall, the idea is really just to follow that flow of, of where we go. And the thing that's usually quite interesting about it is that it allows you to sort of get deeper and deeper into a certain topic and, and like really, um, yeah unpack something in quite a profound way. And I think uh, the invitation also is as much as possible to just bring in all the different facets of, of what you might be feeling or experiencing. So both the, the beautiful, the challenging, the messy, the exciting, um, just whatever it is that seems important. And I guess, uh, yeah, I think it's probably important to just uh, remind ourselves that this is a bit of an experiment to be doing this with such an audience around us. So um, I guess a big thank you to both those of you who have agreed to be in this fishbowl and be uh, witnessed, and also to, to everyone else who's here who uh, wants to listen and learn and who will hopefully also uh, share your thoughts on the mural that then Anna can also bring back in if, you, if there's something that you want to contribute to the conversation. So I think that's what I'll say so far. Um, and yeah, invite us into, into our round. And so what I'd love to hear from each of you just as we go in, and it's sort of like a, a quick fire round, right? So we do wanna um, have time to dive into the conversation soon. So it's a bit of a speedy one. Um, just briefly your name, uh, the organization or project that you're, I guess, sort of working in at the moment that, that seems important to, to bring in how long you have lived where you currently are, like where you're currently living, um, and how long has like remote working been part of your life? Just to get a bit of a sense of, of where we all sit. Um, anyone feeling called to kick off? I'm sort of wanting to leave it open and then uh, maybe we can do the tagging thing that you just call on the next person. I can start us off. So Thanks, I'm Lana Yelenyev and I'm with Thrivable World, although I collaborate with other organizations as well. And I've been here in the Netherlands um, for the past 18 years now. And I've been doing remote work even before the pandemic, so more than seven years already. And I'll pass it on to you, Nenad. Thanks. Nenad Malkovic, I'm in Croatia all my life, and I live between Pula, where I'm at the moment, which is my hometown, and Zagreb, which is capital of Croatia. And uh, all my life, that means 61. <laughs> so um, remote work thing, I think I've been doing at least since... 2013, uh, right after I joined the first uh, gathering of uh, transition towns, uh, we continued collaborating uh, remotely. And uh, 
Yeah, so it's over over 11 years now. Over to Anka. Hi, everyone. My name is Anka Damerel. Um, I work for Unorthodox. I'm the director of, of innovation, and I work on a project called Regenerative Futures. And I'm originally from Romania, but I've been based in, in Cambridge in the UK uh, for about 11 years. This is where I started my family and I'm growing roots. Um, and I have been working uh, remotely, I would say, uh, for over 15 years now. Uh, but the pace of how this has changed, how I, I work, I would say has increased exponentially over the over the last years. And I will pass it on to Franzi. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Franzi. I'm part of the Climate Farmers team. And I am located in Berlin. I've been here for the past five years. And I think I'm the typical example for transitioning into the whole remote world uh, through COVID. Handing over to Sarah. Hi. Um, so I work for um, something called the Bioregional Weaving Lab in Southeast Ireland. I'm right now in a small fishing village called Cheek Point, looking out at where rivers meet and the tides come and go. Um, I am originally from Scotland, lived in Norway for 25 years, and now I'm mostly based here. Um, I feel remarkably unremote compared to some of my other periods of life, but then I was thinking, I do, I work remotely to, to everybody in every direction. So I'm both, both my teamlets and the other bioregional weaving labs around different European countries to our backbone organizations who are based in the Netherlands. And also, if I have to be truthful to many of the stakeholders that I work with in my own bioregion, which is about 100 kilometers by 150. So it's always remote in different ways, but maybe not the definition of sitting on a screen completely detached. I'll pass it on to Johannes. Hi, I'm Johannes. I'm right now based in Munich, uh, on the outskirts of Munich, Germany. Uh, the place that I'm right now in, I've been living for half a year, but if you draw a circle of 60 kilometers around Munich, I've been living there all my life. So 31 years. And um, being fully remote in the sense of working mostly digitally, I would say one year. But I can connect to that, what you, Sarah, said for the last six or seven years, I've been in projects where I, most of the time was not in the place where the collaborators were and you had to find other ways of connecting. Uh, so what's completely new to me in the sense of one year only is being fully connected via screen and digital tools to my collaborators. And I'm working uh, amongst others at Unity Effect. We are a small team supporting others, organizations and individu individuals in the process of becoming a more thriving team, a more regenerative organization, everything that currently a lot of people are working on. And I pass on to Anaik. Yes, thank you. I'll be brief. Uh, my name is Anaik, unorthodox. I have lived uh, where I live in Divan les Bains for all my life. Um, and I've been doing the remote working similar to you, Franzi, uh, since the COVID happened yeah that was everyone right and yeah i think i'm somehow feeling drawn to also answer this question myself so i don't maybe i wasn't supposed to but um yeah so i've been living in the place i am um, which is uh, near barcelona a bit north for three years now and actually i've never not done remote working so it's been about 12 years and it's true that there's been phases where there's been maybe more people that were physically also in an office most of the time when I was working with the WeShare community in Paris. But actually, no one was ever there in the office. That everyone was so even when we had one, uh, somehow people were always everywhere, and online was the place to to find each other. So yeah, it feels very hard for me to actually imagine something else, um, even though I definitely yearn for other things. 
and uh, often imagine this like wow being in physical proximity all the time what that could be like um so yeah very very interesting topic to me and um excited to dive in and I guess I also just want to name that I think there's a few other people from unorthodox that are in the room here um not in this fishbowl right now and also from greater than and that if you feel called to jump in uh to add your experience that, that you're welcome to do that as well um by by turning on your camera and I think with that we're gonna dive in and so the idea, just to remind again with this fishbowl, is that it's basically like a dynamic panel and we have like four chairs. We have four chairs in the middle, so that's four people with their video on. And uh, as we basically uh, like weave the conversation, we we come in and out uh, of those four chairs um, to to contribute and, and share ideas and, and build on each other. Um, so basically the idea is that, uh, yeah, four of you now stay in the middle. Um, if someone else wants to join in, then we might be five for a brief moment, but the idea then is that another person leaves or that if someone leaves and then there's just uh, three people that then someone else joins in. Um, and overall, I guess what I always find really uh, helpful with the fishbowl uh, is that Obviously, like if you come in and ask a question that you also stay to like engage with the answer from the others. So it's not like, uh, especially with the online. So this is the funny thing, right? Compared to doing these in person with a physical chair, it's more effort to get up and sit down on the chair and then get up and go out again. And just going click, click, turning on and off the camera is so easy. But um, I really urge you that once you've come in to sort of stay for like a flow of the conversation and then when when something feels like maybe it's come to a close or your contribution is uh, yeah, done for that moment because you can always come back again, of course, the, the venue leaves, uh, if that makes sense. Any questions from, from anyone here about how this is gonna work? Okay. So the question that I'd like to kick us off with, and then as I said, like the idea is to really just flow from there and bring in whatever feels right. Um, how do you experience both working remotely and working in this this field and topic of regeneration in your day day to day very concretely like how does it feel to be doing those two things um at the same time uh the remote working and and working on regeneration that is so focused uh or where it is so important to be connected to place um and i really want to invite us to just think like really, uh, yeah, concrete and story-based. Like if you have any stories that you could share, um, yeah, examples. And I really wanna invite in both the challenging things, the messy things, the exciting, the beautiful, um, the things that have flowed wonderfully, all of those um, in whatever order feels right. So with that, I'm gonna uh, disappear. And uh, I'm gonna invite a few of you to stay. We ha we didn't actually decide who would start. <laughs> so uh, let's see uh, who who's ready to go. Um, here are, we have three, maybe one more person can come in. Um, and then we can get started. And I would like to start. Okay, great. And just if another person who's in the fishbowl wants to pop in, so we have four people to start, um, please don't be shy. And please uh, kick off Leonard and I'll put the question in chat. Thanks. So when I was introducing myself, I forgot to mention organizations I'm working through. And uh, uh, I would like to explain that um, I mostly work as a network leader and a group process facilitator in the context of permaculture eco villages and transition towns. And it's all about regenerative cultures as Daniel Christian Wall explains in his book. And um, I learned all about remote work and remote collaboration through pain and frustration. And the reason for that is that for me, and I believe that's so for many people, whatever happens in immediate physical environment takes precedence, not what happens on screens. And uh, at one point I realized that I need to create some kind of a professional, personal, professional strategy that is somehow connecting all the levels I'm uh, working on. 
And again, Daniel Christian Wall was inspiration with uh, his writing about scale linking. So I worked locally uh, to translocally to bioregional scale through organization called Croatian Permaculture, and I work in Croatian language. And from continental to global level of scale, I worked through a number of networks and organizations, but my home organization, home collective is greater than, and I work in English. So I somehow tried to find a way to connect for myself what I do from local level of scale to global level of scale. I would say no one should worry about talking over each other. Feel free to just jump right in. Thank you for, for that. I'm happy to, to jump in. So just as a, as a reminder, I work for, for Unorthodox. And Unorthodox, we do a lot of unlearning and relearning um, about difficult problems links to, linked to, to conservation. So we spend a lot of time in what we refer to that scaling deep phase of looking at what are the root causes of the conservation issues that we see globally. And most of our, our activities stem from connecting people around the globe from various sectors, from uh, various backgrounds, um, and looking at the various worldviews, values that they bring and facets when they look at the problem at the problem together. So there is a an important element of being able to to connect with individuals at a very deep level, particularly when you, we talk about people, people's values. And my experience has has really changed over time we used to be organizing face-to-face -face events all the time and post post covid this very much changed to organizing this meetings gatherings exchange in the through the online medium and it really raised a lot of questions of how do you go deep to that levels of connections when you don't have the people face to face um and I have to say that through the engagement of with the regenerative topic, which we are exploring as an organization under an initiative called Regenerative Futures, which is looking to ask questions about how people understand regeneration, how people uh, or who whose voices are being heard, uh, questions about uh, justice, inclusivity, colonial perspectives on this. It adds another layer when you have you want to go in the exploration of this very hard topics uh by working remotely with people around the globe uh people who have to speak in in a in a second language most most often um so i have to say that particularly my experience in the last year having engaged with the topic of regeneration has been really really eye opening in terms of the the flow of values in terms of the connection that we set with with individuals um and just really rethinking my role as an as an individual in how i steer the direction of the conversation as how i bring myself to to the conversation and how i engage with the regenerative topic in itself If I can add to that, Anka, thank you for for this. I re really resonate. I agree that since opening up this topic of regeneration, it's been much more also towards us at an organization level, but also us at the personal level. And there's this aspect of inner regeneration as well that's been coming up, but also this other kind of layer of, as you said, how we can be ourselves but also build trust and connection and understand the values through a screen so it's 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 really 
it's layered in many ways for me. And I, I struggle a bit with that first question that's been asked, but um, I, I really resonate with what you just said. It's a lot about introspection and as we are using systems thinking, it's important for us to um, to understand how we are embedded in our ecosystem and our role in it and as a person, as an organization. And yeah, so thank you. I agree. I think I can very much relate to the whole struggle when you open the discussion around regeneration in in the team and in, in the organization and then what to do with it on a personal note and in in climate farmers we work in the field of regenerative agriculture but me personally in my role I am in the people and culture area so I don't have so much the focus on the the agricultural aspect but rather understanding of what regeneration which we understand not as an end state but always as a journey um what that means for us in 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 an organization and each individual and i think some of the cornerstones there is that we really find our ways on how to unlock our full potential to be creative to be innovative innovative how to be on your own personal inner journey but then how to support each other if you always see each other in that virtual 2D setup where there's just this very important human connection of touch, not touch in a, in an inappropriate way, but in the morning, a nice hug, having a cup of coffee, seeing how that person looks when they turn off the meeting. Um, all these like little aspects, they're missing when we're in this um, setup. And at the same time, because we're here also discussing the topic um, in the context of place, I also see the beauty of being remote because in our team, we have some people who choose the city life, but we also have a lot of people where I'm pretty sure that they are only contributing to our mission with their rich knowledge because they can be in the place where they are and where they want to be and in many cases for us this is a farm um and so for me personal i am constantly exploring and that's why i'm very happy to have this space here to be um discussing and exploring together is that tension of all the advantages that we get for us personally as well um to be in the place where we choose to be and then all the challenges that come with it being on such an intense journey and asking all these um, very challenging questions in a collective. Yeah, my experience with um, working remote has been, I would say, uh, phenomenal in, in a sense of it really allowed me to experience depths of connection that is different yet at the same time profound in a lot of layers. Um, having experienced how people interacted during COVID and um, yeah, accommodations that are being made with different uh, with different team members and in terms of how they can engage more, uh, it really opened me to getting rid of just one layer of looking at how we can connect to adding a different dimension on how we can connect. So for me, um, what has been really going strong when it comes to doing remote work and being in this regenerative field is how um, it's like a, an accordion in my experience of like, we can now choose and opt in and out on how we'd want to engage with each other. And that I find such great beauty in how we can restore ourselves as well. Like say, for example, I, I remember certain meetings where just the idea that you can take off your video and you know lie down if you need to, that just opened me to, hey, yes, there's not one way of engaging. 
and people engage in different ways. So for me, this this um yeah remote work has been restorative in that level of what would I need to be able to engage with full presence in whatever it is that I'm working on and how do I invite others in this practice as well so for me the regeneration work that I'm doing with organizations is really getting back into this inside out of how can we show up as um, individuals with our gifts, with our strengths, with our talents, and at the same time honor, you know, what is needed or, or what is within our capacity at a given moment. Um, so doing remote work has really um, allowed me to explore areas or dimensions of how I can engage and connect in ways that I have not done, you know, when we were doing face-to-face -face engagement. And as um, focusing also on trauma and healing, uh, I'm realizing that a lot of my people-pleasing behaviors or um, what we would call uh, masking and overriding tendencies, it's easier to peel those layers. It was easier for me to peel those layers out because now I have the agency to choose how, how much or how little or how deep or how shallow that I would want to engage in these spaces. It's really interesting because, I mean, I, I think I have to bring that sort of, I, I feel quite different about working remotely and I quite often feel panic because I can't get in touch with the soil, with the wind, with the smells, with walking across the top of the mountains, you know, and I, I think that feeling of being tasked to work with this term regeneration, which means returning, you know, giving, giving back to the bioregion and how can we, can we can really give back to, to, or, or, or support other people to give back. You know, the, the local people are often the people that are going to be doing the, the true regeneration um, in the bioregion that I, that I work with. And, and I think, you know, trying to pretend that, that anything apart from being there is going to be the ultimate, the most effective way. You know, I mean, I, I work for, I was, well, there's, there's two stories. We were asked to talk about stories. So so one story was just this morning and we, we went out for a walk and I went out for a drive uh, down the bog road, you know, to look at a reclaimed bog. And you we, we just drew, drew in, parked the car. And just as we parked the car, someone else drove past, stopped, got out and started talking. And it was the local farmer. And we laughed and we sort of like exchanged stories. And, you know, out of that came a deep understanding of the, the cultural history, the heritage, everything that, why the bogs there, how the drainage had worked, who had too many cows, who was, you know, all these things. And that that spontaneity, you know, would never happen and couldn't happen. And, and we just wouldn't get those insights working on a screen because that's that's not part of, and yet it is what will in the long run we could start sowing seeds, as, as Ray often says, about you know, how could you start putting multi-species forwards into the, into the brain of somebody who hasn't been talking and been taking those steps beforehand. Um, so I think it's those, those sort of like on the ground moments that matter so much. And then another, the other story on another level, I suppose, is, is the, the way we work with Common Land as one of our backbone organisations, and they work with this framework work of the four returns, thinking that if a landscape is degraded and we want to bring back four kinds of um, value, then we've got to bring back social value and new meaningful jobs. We've got to bring something back to the land through nature. We've got to bring back financially sustainable models. But most importantly, we've got to bring back a sense of inspiration and hope uh, to the people that that can come together and together drive that systemic change and the big shifts. And I think bringing back inspiration um, through screens is a hard one. I think, you know, I look at who I work with um, uh, I, um, on the different returns, I suppose, and some of the financial models for bioregionalism, all that tends to be happening on screen at the moment. And, and I'm talking to people, reading things through them. Um, but some of the other ones, I think the inspiration, I can be inspired but in the end, to get the inspiration onto the ground and really get people thinking, yes, we could make a change, I think is very hard. I think we can take it so far, but then it makes me sort of really, can we do this without really getting out and listening to other people rather than thinking about our own inner change? We should be really getting down and listening to the land and to the people. So um, that's, that's where I am. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Um, 
I don't know if you saw my neighbor just passed and get got me berries. It just picked. It was really lovely. I I could not have had that if I, you know, if I stayed in indoor. So it's funny, <laughs> funny quick story. Um, I I I agree with what you just said and talking about inspiration and hope and be have the time to be creative, have the time to be innovative, to have space for creativity in our daily work being on screen being remote it's such a such a struggle for me whenever I have time I'm like okay I'm going to open my to-do list and just check some stuff and I don't have this inspiration moment of saying like okay I'm gonna get creative I'm gonna think beyond what can I do you know to improve even the projects we're working on you know it's always going to the backlogs of things that I need to do and and I think it brings me to question, and it's just an open question, but how do we handle this pace that's been quicker and quicker? Like we we want to do things super f quickly and efficiently and being on a remote, you can be in a meeting at that time and then one minute later you're in another meeting and you can just like go like that for the whole day if you don't handle it so well. So it's it's not really a, an answer, more a question about the pace of the way we work being a remote team. And I don't know if that's something that's shared amongst the the room today. Anna, you wanna go first or shall I? Um, if you don't mind, I just wanted to tie in the, the seasons into all of this, because for me, the whole element of um, moving from from sustainability into the space of regeneration has been the connection with with nature and the world outside of me. And one of those key elements, even as particularly as a woman, has been to to connect to the cycles, and cycles meaning the seasons directly outside of me. Um, thankfully, that still occur vastly with climate change, but they do. And I think if we don't start looking towards towards the world of of Mother Nature as an answer even to that question that you just posed and it's like winter shows us it's like we can't all the time be in a pace of of summer and producing fruit i mean we we also can't be going to the supermarket and having all the things that we have all year long right that is not going to keep us regenerative and if we start looking also at ourselves in that same way and as our teams that we need times of pause we need times of darkness where we we actually hibernate and allow for things to um to to take time and then there's time for creation and production and all of that um and i find that for having grown up in many different places and really not knowing what it even means to be in place over time. I look at Nanad and I'm like, wow, yes, I want to know what that means to be in one place for 61 years, despite or even with all of the challenges that take place right, in a country that um, has experienced war and, and all of that and not run away. And I think the urgency also comes in with us wanting to run away from things, from the depth of conversations, from the depth of relationships, from the hard stuff, from the boring stuff, from all of that. Um, no, that's my take. Thanks, Anna. So going back to the relationship between remote work and regeneration, I mentioned earlier that whatever I learned about remote work was through frustration and pain. And to put it in a nutshell, I would compare that frustration and pain to a being in a long distance relationship, long distance romantic relationship. It's very painful and very frustrating. But there is even deeper tension for me in combining regeneration and uh, remote work. When we collaborate remotely, when we communicate remotely, what we are actually doing, we are just moving pixels on the screen. Sometimes we move words on the paper on, or somewhere. But for generation to happen, it is necessary to move atoms in objective universe, in objective reality. And that's where connection to place is essential and that's why i like that we have climate farmers here by original weaving love and similar organizations where people work on the ground 
in my networks, what happened is that very often we have people that are not willing or not able to travel because they have a project on the ground. And very early, we needed to start learning how to make our in-person events inclusive for remote collaborators. So for us, developing skills of remote work was about inclusion. Over to Johannes. Yeah, I have two stories in mind that I wanted to share. Um... I hugely resonated with what you said, Sarah, about this serendipity moments and running into someone and clarifying something in five minutes that would have taken a year of online meetings sometimes that happens in, in, in physical uh, reality. And for me, the first story is um, growing up in a smaller town in Bavaria um, through online spaces I could connect to uh, realities that I could not know that they were there because they did not exist in my physical reality. So I had the option of, of course, books, for example, were a first step and then connecting to people, seeing that they offer something online, watching videos. Then when we had the time of video conferences coming and connecting to these people and um, being able to step into places where I would have never been able to travel or to uh, or to go to or to connect to even because there was just a link that I could click on and could join and I could be part of that without even yeah having the need to speak up. And um, so for me, I see that I need to have for myself a certain connection in a regenerative place surrounding whatever that is and from that I can feel these different connections that are there and the second story is from our uh, team at unity effect um, I only joined one year ago but actually um, five years ago I was one of the first participants of what was called a leadership journey and they decided to run this program in English online even if the original funding team met in, in Germany. And I was working in a project back then, which was rural. We did a build a community and suddenly I was connected to people in uh, Romania, in Ghana, in and we could speak about the situation. Okay, we are young people and we want to change something about the leadership, how we show up. And suddenly I had this connection of... Um, seeing other people hearing different stories uh connecting to that so for me i think um my remote work um is something else than the deep local connection that i have and they both infuse into each other and melt and blend and do <laughs> strange stuff um but when i get frustrated over the screen and or everything that is there, then I just need to go out into my physical reality. And that's, for example, why I work part time, because then I can do all the other fancy stuff that I do and connect to people and do. Um, yeah, so I think for me, part time here also is a huge shift. And suddenly we're transitioning into an organization that is part time remote, which sounds even more complex. But it is because we all have physical realities that we want to contribute to. May it be projects, may it be families, may it be whatever. And discovering the joy and the potential in that. Also what you mentioned, Lana. Yeah, I, I deeply resonate with what you shared, John, is around the possibilities it opened in terms of meeting new people and, and like you, I got to know Michelle Holiday uh through a course that she um that she gave that that was like four years ago, and up on up until now I continuously have and I have this um relationships connections that are formed online that continue to exist and allows me to to have that yeah you know, I would say abundance of 
um connections all throughout the globe and i know we even had a chat with, with my kids with my teenagers and it's like mama do you have uh people all around the world that you know at least in one you know one one pe one person in one country and i said i don't know but maybe i would like to make a list <laughs> but that that for me is the beauty of how remote work has touched my life in a sense of um, not just, you know, not just around neurodivergence where um, we think differently, we process information differently, and therefore, you know, having the opportunity to choose how to engage in different ways rather than just face-to-face. -face. Um, but it also allowed me, like, you know, Nick, what you're saying about the pacing, it allowed me to recalibrate how I pace myself. Um, because then I have the agency of, do I add this in in my calendar or not? Um, and I and it's easier to spread things around. It's easier to look at you know look at look at my calendar and say, oh wait a minute, I have you know two back to back Zoom calls already. Maybe it's time for me to decompress and do something else. And a big part of the work that I do is since I work with leaders and founders, I see it as the bridging of like I um or or uh how I my 13 year old would describe myself as the pebble <laughs> like how how can I create ripples and when I show up in spaces virtually and get to deepen the work with them I see the ripple effect of how that you know approach of deepening connection seeing each other for our wholeness um, allows them to bring that back into the work that they're doing uh, I've been here in the Netherlands and away from the motherland. I'm originally from the Philippines for, uh, I would say, almost 21 years now. And only when I moved out of the Philippines that I really appreciated what we call kapwa. So in Filipino psychology, pakikipagkapwa is similar to Ubuntu, which means what is our shared humanity. And when I started working remotely, I realized it's easier to see our shared humanity because of the restrictions that we normally wouldn't have, like, you know, place restrictions, language restrictions. Of course, there is still a privilege in the way that we're using English as a common language. Yet, I've been to spaces where they would have transcription going, where they would have a translator going. So for me, the, the, the tension um, that I might say, uh, is the binary um binarity of thinking it's an either or rather it's an end end you know that and you know remote work supports me and it can also limit certain connections or limit certain um engagement so i just wanted to let everyone know in the fishbowl that we have about eight minutes left for this part of the sharing before we go into a final async reflection so this is the moment to jump in if there's something that's still popping for you that you want to share. Um, just want to let you know. Thank you. Yeah, just briefly, maybe I was not so clear earlier when I was speaking. My point was, and thank you, Dove, for helping me clarify that. My point was that if we are talking about re regeneration, it cannot be only about people. It needs to be about landscapes. It needs to be about watersheds. It needs to be about... Uh, living world beyond just humans and um, the way to make remote work more purposeful is to focus on activities like that. But it's a very good point um, about, you know, how do we bring in nature? You know, how do we really get that feel for, for land and soil on, on a remote place? <laughs> because we can we can talk a lot about how we can connect on a human relational basis. Um, and I still don't know that it's the same kind of, I, I, I'm i really interested in listening to Lana because, you know, I don't think I have developed those kind of same, same in-depth, really good relationships. I know people all over the world, and other, but I think they've all nearly all come from really quite personal points through, through my life. Um, and I was thinking about um, extreme emotions. I think some of my most frustration 
moments have been looking at a blank screen, turning off the sound, turning off the video and screaming at the computer. But at the same time, um, being able to do that is actually quite liberating. And then that reminded me of Liberating Structures, which I'm, I'm sure many people know about, but it's a fantastic um, organisation. And I have never laughed as much as I did online once when they were doing it properly and realising that you can find really funny people that genuinely make me laugh, which I... It was such a relief because I think too much of stuff what happens online I don't quite relate to. I don't feel I'm on the same wavelength. There's always very earnest, very genuine people, and I'm going oh. But then suddenly you find the moment where you find your connection, and you, you just I was laughing and laughing, you know. So it can happen, but I think it's very rare. Um, and I love that sort of um, personal connection here, where you know on the ground when you you can do it in a slightly more uh, you don't feel so black and white with it. I don't know. There's something like you can be somewhere in the middle and and just like be in that room and feel feel happy to be there in a different way without feeling that I haven't contributed. But I think we also have to remember that inclusion. You know, there's one thing about doing it digitally, and then there's the inclusion element of remote farmers sitting on farms that are never going to come out and they're not going to connect through through digital. And I think coming from from Norway to Ireland and seeing the difference in that need for conversations and culture of meeting in a tiny little pub in the middle of nowhere and singing songs and you know that's not going to happen in the same way as it might on online so i i just think we have to be very realistic about what what you know you, you can do a lot with regeneration but you there's some things that we just need to cherish so much about the local landscapes cultures heritage time the time element of the, the, the landscape and the cultures and things that oh, we just can't do and is so important to regeneration. So I think um, limits and be realistic. Sarah, I can almost feel, you know, the, the it's it's like a palpability of the experience. Um, it is what you know what you're saying really resonates with me. And at the same time, there is also for me of like, ooh, this type of connections also need time, right? The the ways in which we can engage with each other in such a deep and um oh, what's this, you know, meaningful and impactful ways. Oftentimes, it's across, uh, it's across periods as well. So especially when you're, um, collaborating on certain projects. And what I love about the opportunities that remote work provides is, you know, it's like you've, it, it seems like oh, you've known each other for so so long already that by the time that you're in the same place together, there's just so much buzz and so much electricity and so much. Um, uh, what's this uh, happiness around being with one another, and that's that's what I cherish the most, the most in terms of the uh, collaborations that I've been or the work that I've been doing, where the element of being online for a long time and then having that element of hey, there there is an opportunity to meet face to face, and how can we be together face to face? It seems like. Uh, I, I like Nena Dewalago, the, that analogy that he said of like being um, in long distance relationships <laughs> and and when you gather, when you meet each other face to face, it seems like, oh, I know this person, I see this person and that it makes the work in terms of how we can do things together easier as well. Can I ask though, how does that translate that into regeneration um, happening on the land? How do you see that link? Yeah, well, in uh, what's this? In some of the projects that I've been in, uh, there's always uh, there's always the invitation of how can we, you know, how can we honor the land? How can we honor the ancestors? So the conversations, even before seeing each other, has been placed with that. There's there's a deepening of what what is the ancestry that you're bringing in? What is you know within your field that you're bringing in? Um, and, and this is why the depth of conversations is also very important in terms of how to su support that, you know, that connection. Uh, because in the spaces that I um, facilitate, we go into that level of how are we bringing in ancestry? How are we be bringing in 
um, healing histories in a conversation. And and so that that is more like, even though we're not in the same space, but we've been introduced to each other's fields. What you said, Lana, um, about how the build up online of relationships and how that can help to really jump off then when you actually meet in person that resonates it um, a lot with me and I think it's a nice connection of under or it's a great question to really think about how can we make that connection from the online space to then meet in person um, and it's something that at Climate Farmers we're experimenting a lot with because we're spread throughout different countries and we usually meet a few times um, per year sometimes more in different team constellations but at least once or twice as a whole organization and what we started doing there is to go back to the same place again and again and we are usually either in some sort of community um, area or um, uh, location or in a farm and now we have been I think three times already in the same farm um, outside of Berlin and it's really nice because for some people that have been there for a few times you can see how it is just more familiar and it's like a homecoming. Um, and every time when we're there, some part, some time of the day we spend in something that we call placemaking challenge. So we always work together with the location and we ask what is needed for the place and for the people that will come after us to that location that we can contribute to the place. Um, and then every year we try to connect it also with the, to the work that we're doing. And we have created, for example, it was a, just a wild meadow and now it has some sort of a bar and we have built a fencing system and a dance floor that is lined by some trees. And that's really nice. We have come, been coming back to, to that place this year after we have kind of built it last year and it was super nice. We have built composting systems for, for a place where we have been. So that was a really nice way for us to, one, I think it's good to have that known space when you come together and you leave the virtual room because everything is already so exciting um, but then also really connecting to the land being in nature when we are together and trying to understand how can we help that land there and contribute to it instead of just taking from it by being there and spending a super intense time I think that's a really great uh, note for us to close this part of our conversation on um, I feel like we could probably go on for a very long time. Um, super, super interesting. And I got to say, um, this this last point you're sharing, Francie, really reminds me of what has become sort of like a standard ingredient in most of the communities I'm in, which is trying to basically connect the in-person meetings that happen at some kind of recurring basis with the online. So really, as Lana was saying, it's not like one or the other, but it's connecting both and how they can sort of... Uh, yeah, like become become more and actually, uh, yeah, reinforce the the positive elements of each other rather than like subtracting. Um, and I guess I wonder whether maybe there's something about the online space that maybe sometimes makes us forget to like do that yes and 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 go to other places because you sort of can get sucked into it. Um, so yeah, I guess. Uh, Thank you everyone so much for, for your contributions to, to the conversation um, now like with the on the screen and also uh, on our mural. And so I'd like to invite everyone